John chapter 21 is where we're going to be. This is um, post-resurrection. Jesus already uh, resurrected, and he had come to show himself to his disciples. And, um, and so we pick up the story. It's, it's a fascinating story. If you haven't read the story of, of um, Jesus' life, I encourage you to do it. There's, there's four gospels that tell it. Uh, three of them are similar, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the gospel of John takes a different approach. And so uh, we're looking at the, the gospel of John today. Um, chapter 21 says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Gal Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got in a boat. And that night they caught nothing. Now remember, this Jesus had already died. Peter had already denied Jesus. All the disciples were no, nowhere to be found except for John and Mary at the, at the foot of the cross with Jesus. And so, and so John picks up the narrative with them going fishing, them returning back to what they know. Uh, verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. That's a very familiar phrase, right? Do you remember when Peter, when Peter was first encounter, his first encounter with Jesus? When they did that, they were unable to haul the net in because a large number of fish. Then the, disciples whom, then the disciple whom Jesus loved <clears throat> said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for there were not far from shore but a hundred yards when they landed they saw a fire burning of coals where there were fish on it and some bread Jesus said to them bring some of the fish you have caught so Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore it was full of large fish 153 don't don't focus on the number the 153 Theologians have done it, and, and it just, it's just 153. It's just 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. It, it, these stories are starting to sound familiar, right? When he feeds the 5,000. His behavior is the same. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. When he had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Is it me or is my voice echoing? It's echoing, right? There's like an echo going on. And, and he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. God, I pray as we dive into your word and we unpack what you have for us today, Lord, that, that our hearts would be receptive to what your spirit has for us. Lord, we would be courageous to accept. We would be courageous to apply. We we'll would be courageous, Lord God, to do what your word says to do. Lord, you know there are many of us in here. And as we, as we dive through the life of Peter, we're going to so relate to him. And God, I pray when that moment happens, the moment of realization, the moment of reality, truth, God, I pray that we don't run from it, but 
but we embrace it. Allow your spirit to heal. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. I'll turn to your neighbor and say, it's not over. It's not over. Peter had just, he had just made the biggest failure of his life. Committed the biggest failure. Intentionally committed the biggest failure of his life. And that was to deny Jesus. And so we're going to unpack that. And we look at Peter's life and we go, man, if, Peter, if Peter's life can have redemption, then our life can too, even after failures. It's like, it's like riding a horse. It could be fun or dangerous. I don't know if we have any cowboys or cowgirls in the house, but when you ride a horse, it's, it's, it's an amazing moment, right? It's this powerful beast that you're, that you're sitting in a saddle, and, on the saddle, and, 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 and you're just feeling his strength, right? It, it's fun and it's dangerous. The moment that the horse gets spooked and, and bucks you off, I don't know if you've ever been bucked off a horse, you can seriously get hurt. The fear of, of hitting the ground or, you know, or the horse stomping on you while you're on the ground. And, and sometimes just hitting the ground and getting the wind knocked out of you. I mean, I don't know when's the last time you've had the wind knocked out of you, but you never forget those moments, right? When the wind is knocked out of you, you feel like you're going to die. It's like you're gasping for air everywhere. And all these painful experiences, they create this fear to get back on the saddle. Right, that's where we get that phrase, cowboy up, right? Let's, let, like, okay, you, you fail, let's get up. Let's get back on the horse. Or maybe have you ever played baseball? I, I was, I'd like to say this with, with some sincerity. I, I, was, I was athletic growing up. And uh, I, I, I know, I know it's hard to look at me now, 46 years old, and go, well, why are you really athletic? Yes, I was. And, um, and um, you know, there's... I played every sport known to man, um, and, and uh, you know, baseball was one of them. It's just, it's just what Hispanics did. We played baseball and soccer, right? That's what, is that too stereotyping? Um, I was no good at soccer, but I, I had a hand at baseball, and I don't know if you've ever stood in a batter's box. And you know, the average high schooler can throw up to 70 to 80 miles an hour, and, and if you've ever stood in a batter's box and have a ball flying at you at such uh, uh, speeds, it, it could get nerve-wracking. It could get nerve-wracking. And you never forget, for all you baseball players, you know what I'm talking about, you never forget the first time you've been hit with the ball at that speed. And, and the pain of it. And, and having to get back in the batter's box, you know, it creates this anxiety. Like, oh, my gosh, like, is that pitcher going to throw another ball at me? Or is he going to, you know, try to, try to get it across the plate? Like, what's going on, you know? And so you kind of, you chicken out and you kind of get out of the batter box a little bit, right? You kind of extend your arms more because it creates this anxiety. Like, I, I, don't, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to fail. I, I don't want to deal with the next pitch. But if once you stand in the batter's box and, and you deal with it, you know, you get over it. One of the bravest things a person can do when they fail or get hurt is, is to try again. So you get back on the saddle or you get back in the batter's box. The point I'm trying to make to you in this introduction is that, listen, it's, it's when we crash and burn, we cannot allow the fear of failure and, and, and the fear of the unknown to keep us from living life. Because we fail. We make mistakes. We do things that are outside of the will of God. We do things that we know we shouldn't do. Our choices can create a mess in our life. I don't know if you've ever been there where your choices have created a mess. And, and sometimes you can't outlive your choices. It's like, my goodness, is this ever going to go away, right? There's consequences for it. I get it. I get it. And consequences of shame and guilt and condemnation, maybe even physical consequences because you're not taking care of your body or consequences like bankruptcy or divorce or legal consequences from choices that you've made. It's like, it's like we, we can't escape the mistakes of our lives. There, there, there are many areas that we can find ourselves coming short all the time, all the time. And if we don't deal with our failures and mistakes appropriately, well, 
then we can find ourselves pretty quick. We can find ourselves pretty quick in a very unhealthy situation, whether it's a physical or spiritual or emotional. We have to learn how to deal with failure. We have to learn how to deal with, with understanding that, that you're going to fail, right? You're going to make a mistake. How do I, how do I deal with it? Right? It's like, it's like the, the motorcyclists. I don't know if any people ride motorcycles, but, you know, they, they say it's not, it's not if you fall, it's when you fall. At some point, you're going to lay that bike down. Right? And how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? The Bible is packed with stories of men and women who've missed the mark. They've, they, they've had good intentions, but they failed. They, they, they never meant to hurt people, but their huge mistakes and consequences really damaged the lives of others. Take King David, for example. His failures, it caused thousands of people to lose their lives. Such gravity in our consequences. They, they, listen, they love the Lord. You can read the scriptures. They love the Lord with all their heart. But at the end of the day, they've come up short because of decisions that they've made. And, and can, can you remember a time when you've missed the mark? Can you remember a time when you've really failed and you really made a mistake? A time when, when, when your mistake brought shame and guilt? Can you think of a time when you've messed up and you've said to yourself, and we've all said this before, we said to ourselves, if I would have never have done that, my life would be very different right now. Be very different. It's like, I, I, I think we all want that rewind button, right? That do-over button. Like if I just had that do-over button, I, I would, there's some things in some, in some areas of my life that I would do over. I, I think... When it comes to failure, I think we're, we're tremendously hard on ourselves. And because we're so hard on ourselves, healing never happens. But I, I think today is going to be different. I think, I think we're going to learn from Peter. You know, we, the regrets and, and, the, and the shame and the mistakes, all those things, they, they become tremendous testimonies tremendous testimonies when we have an overcoming attitude and, and, and we allow the grace of God to heal us and to move us forward. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. I'm here to tell you that your mistake and your failure, whatever it is, what, whenever it was or whenever it might be, that if you just trust the Lord in your mistake and your failure, his grace is sufficient. His grace will get you through. His grace will help you overcome. And the life of Peter becomes a great case study for us. For, for anyone who's made a huge mistake in their life, if that's you, then today's message is really going to be an encouraging uh, message for you. Because Peter, he suffered some significant failures. When you look at his life, Peter, he, he represents a challenge for all of us who are serious with our relationship with Jesus. I need you to take note of this. He's a representation for every one of us that says we love Jesus. Representation. He exposes just how fragile our loyalty to Jesus is. That's what he does. You're like, not me, never. That's what Peter said. Jesus told him, Peter, you, you're, you're going to face some hard times. Satan wishes to have you. He wants to shift you out. He wants, he wants to destroy your life. And how does Peter respond? He's like, Lord, I would never do that. In fact, I love you more than all of these. Then he points to the other disciples. It's easy for us to sit and, 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 and we can say, I will never forsake the Lord. I will never forsake the Lord. I will never abandon my relationship with God. I will never do those things. Peter exposes just how fragile our loyalty is. That's what he does. It's scary. I know. I know because no one wants to think that they would do that. But Luke tells us that Jesus informs Peter. He says, Peter, you're, you're going to deny me. I'm telling you about my death. I'm telling you what's coming up, and, and you're going to deny me. And, and, and here's what Luke says in the 22nd chapter. He says, he's, Peter replied, man, I, I do not know 
what you're talking about. He's talking to Jesus. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, or he's talking to the girl that, that, that pointed him out. And just as the rooster was, or, or he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and he, get this point here. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he whipped bitterly. Let me, let me unpack that story. As you know, Jesus, is, he got arrested and, and they're taking him to be crucified. And at this point, they're, they're yelling for the release of Barabbas, a criminal. And, and Jesus is there. He's at, he's at the high priest's house. And, and there's Peter at night by the fire. And some little girl, some little girl recognized Jesus. I mean, recognized Peter and says, isn't he one of those guys that followed Jesus? And Peter denies him, denies him. And the moment he did, verse 61 says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Turn and look straight at him. You're like probably thinking, well, how, how bad is it to really deny someone? Well, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad because Jesus was more than just a friend. He was more than just a mentor. He was more than just a good teacher. He was, he was more to Peter than than what we might understand. We can say, well, he was to Peter the Messiah, right? Peter has that revelation in Matthew 18. And, and then he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's the one who caused Peter to walk on water. He's, he's like the, the miracle worker. Peter, Peter had this relationship with Jesus that, that some of the other disciples didn't have. It was intimate. Imagine Imagine someone that you're intimate with, someone that you're supposed to know and have a, a, a tight relationship with, and, and they deny you. They don't even recognize you in a group. You're like, what was that? We go way back. Why would you treat me that way? We've all been snuffed before. We've all been in a group, and, 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 and you get overlooked, and you don't get introduced by the person that's supposed to know you. Or, or, or can you imagine the love of your life denying you, rejecting you? I don't know that person, right? You get in, and it's very realistic. It's like you could get kidnapped, and, and there you are, you know, right outside of Target. And you're like, I don't know her. You can take her. <laughs> she doesn't mean much. Like, what? Really? You don't know me? Like, you told me that you'd give your life for me. That's what Peter did. He said, Jesus, I, I will die for you. And so when Peter denies Jesus, it's not just some random denial. No, it's, 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 this, it's this renouncement of who Jesus is. And who was Jesus? Well, look at Mark 5. When Simon Peter saw this, talking about the nets being filled, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Peter's first encounter with Jesus was recognizing the holiness of who Jesus was. Recognizing the holiness. He's like, he's like I don't deserve to be in your presence. Get, go away from me, Lord, because I'm sinful. Matthew 16, when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And here's Simon Peter. He's like, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. G Peter had on numerous occasions already announced that Jesus was who he said he was. He was God incarnate. He was here sent to, 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 to rescue the lives of those that have been enslaved by sin and so for Peter to denounce him, he's denouncing his very God. He's not just saying, I don't know him. What a huge mistake. The evidence is stacked against Peter, and it's tall, and the failure, and, 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 and the choice. Here's the thing. The choice was deliberate. It was intentional. It wasn't an accident. There's no accidents in our choices, right? They're deliberate. It's like we either do it or we don't do it, right? And Peter, he deliberately denied the Lord. 
turned his back on him. So here's the first point I want you to get from this, from this, this passage is, is take responsibility with God. The first thing, whenever you fail, whenever you make a mistake, whenever you come short, whenever you've done something that is not, is not appropriate with God or is not appropriate with other people and even appropriate with your own life, take responsibility with God. Take responsibility. Peter refuses to own his mistake. He, he, when he denied Jesus, he, he could have corrected his action because he did it three times. The first time he denied Jesus, he was like, okay, you know what? Jesus told me, let me stop. Let me go ahead and be part of what's happening here. But he doesn't do it. You know what happens? He denies him a second time. Even the second time he could have recanted and he could have just resend what he had just said and he could have made things right, but he did not. He would not take ownership. He would not take ownership, so he denied Jesus three times. And, and one of the hardest things to do in life, one of the hardest things, at least for me, is like top five, is to look people in the eye that I have failed, to look, to look people in the eyes that I have hurt, that maybe I brought shame upon, and take responsibility. It's one of the toughest things to do. It's hard. Looking people in the eye and admitting that you were wrong is never easy. The, the moment, here, here's the key, the moment you take ownership, the moment you take responsibility, healing processes can begin. When you deny, deflect, when you shift blame, when, when, when you and I decide, you know what, it's too much to bear, healing doesn't ever happen. Healing only happens when you, when you take the first step and you take responsibility with God. With God. With God. Taking responsibility. And it's hard. I know it's hard. Listen, forgiveness doesn't, doesn't start. Reconciliation doesn't start. It, 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 it never starts. It, it, you know, restitution cannot happen. None of these components that are healthy for, for relationships can begin to happen until we take responsibility. So you have to know that repentance starts when blame shifting ends. Repentance starts when blame shifting ends. It is so critical for us to understand when we have failure in our life, we cannot shift blame. We take the ownership of what we did, our part of the failure, our part of the responsibility, and not shift blame. It's, it's, it's pretty simple, I, I know, but it's, it's so essential. It is so essential. You, you, you can't continue to shift blame. You can't begin to repent unless you're willing to take responsibility for what had happened. Agree to the reality. Admit the truth of it. Not to blame your circumstances or conditions, but to take full ownership of it. And I think sometimes we have a hard time with that. We want to blame our parents for the reason why we are the way we are. You know, we want to blame our economic system. You know, I don't, I, it's because I don't make as much money, so I have to take off the top, so I have to steal. You know, we, we always rationalize, we always justify why it is okay for me to continue in my sin rather than take ownership. We do, it, we do it in our fights. We do it in our, in our arguments with one another as, as, as husband and wife. In, instead of taking ownership of your part of the fight, you want to shift blame. Well, if you would have, well, you always, and you start talking in absolutes, you never, right? It's, it's how we do it. But take responsibility. Listen, re repentance doesn't start. It doesn't start until blame shifting ends. Taking responsibility for our actions, it, it, and I'm, I'm gonna say this, I might get in trouble, but I'm gonna say it. Taking responsibility for our actions is cultural suicide. It really is. It's cultural suicide. In this culture, we have, we have tons of people that will, that will give you all sorts of wonderful ways not to take ownership for your choices. And, and, and it, it, basically it comes down to being a victim. They say, you're the victim. You're the one who's, 
who's being mistreated. You're the one who, who, is, who is not getting what you're supposed to or what you deserve. And, and so that victim mentality we live with. And when we live with victim mentality, I need you to hear this. When you live with victim mentality, taking ownership and responsibility with God is going to be very difficult. Very difficult. David becomes a great example of ownership. He, he writes the, the, the 51st Psalm. I don't know if you're familiar with the story of King David, but King David, he, he loved the Lord, but he, he, had some, he had some hiccups. He had some things in his life that he had to deal with. And, and one of the things that, that, he, that he had done, he had commit murder. He committed murder. He, he was intentional. He plot, he plot the murder of a man so that he can steal his wife. But he did. And he recognized it. And he took ownership. And the ownership, he says, in Psalms 51, this is what he says. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to the great compassion, block out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know, here's the responsibility with God. He says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. And so uh, you need to be very clear what, what David's doing here. It's, he's not saying, listen, my, my sin didn't affect other people. That's not what he's saying. He's saying my sin is, is grievous and, and, and my sin is first and foremost against you because you're the creator of everything. You're the one who, who has put me on this earth, right? If you read his Psalms and David takes this ownership and he takes responsibility with God because his healing cannot come until he is right with God. Right? Psalms 51, he continues. He says in verse 10, he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So he goes into this, this ownership and says, God, I need you because I failed miserably. I need you because, because my choices for, were, were not only affecting me, but they're affecting everyone that I know. I need you, God, because, because what I did was so wrong. My transgressions are before me. In other, words, in other words, he can't outlive his choices. He can't outlive what he had done because, because his sin was so grievous. But he recognized that there's only one person who can heal him. There's only one person who can soothe his hurting soul, his broken heart, the, the heart pain that we talked about last week. There's nothing like heart pain. But God can heal it. He can create a clean heart in you. He can. But you have to take ownership. He can renew a steadfast, a steadfast spirit within you. He can. And he won't take his presence and his Holy Spirit from you, but he'll restore to you the joy of your salvation is what he will do. And grant me a willing spirit. You have to be willing. You have to be willing. See, Jesus, Jesus will teach this. He'll, he'll say, listen, if you have offended your brother or your sister, and you want to present your, your gift to God, he says, leave it at the altar and go make it right. That's ownership. That's ownership. Right? It, it's, and sometimes in the church, we don't want to do those things because they are so, they're so embarrassing. They're so embarrassing. It's like, because we know better, right? And, uh, but when you get over that, when you get over that moment, then you can have the attitude like Nehemiah and Daniel. Nehemiah, when he, when he hears of the sin of his forefathers, when he gets down to pray, he says, we have sinned. He takes ownership. We have failed you, God. He didn't go, my forefathers have failed you. Though that generation before me has done all the wrong, God, you need to give me what we need. No, that's not what Nehemiah did. That's not what Daniel did. They said, we have sinned. He included his generation, said, we've come short. We've made some mistakes. We've 
committed some, some, some errors. And we need your mercy. You have to have that heart. You have to take ownership. Here's the second thing I want you to observe in this passage from Peter's life. Is don't return to old patterns. Don't, don't return to old, when you make a mistake, don't return to old patterns, right? Jesus is walking on the shore and he finds some of his disciples returning to old patterns. That's what they did. John 21 says, this is what Peter says, says, I'm going out to fish. And it seems harmless. It seems like, well, he just needed to kill some time. He needed to, you know, he needed to clear his mind, man. He, Jesus had just died and he had experienced all this, all this uh, pain. And, and so they're like, What's better than going fishing? Let's go fishing. He says, I'm going to go out and go fish. And that's what Simon Peter told them. And then they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into a boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them. He says, friends, have you not any fish? And they, no, they answered. I'm going out to fish were the words of Peter. We, we, we tend to return. Here's the thing. We tend to return to what is comfortable when we fail. We tend to do that. Whenever we, we come short, whenever we're, we're not able to be successful, whenever we're, we're trying to accomplish something new and it does not work out, listen, we, we return to what is comfortable. And it's always easy to go back than to trailblaze ahead. Are you getting that? It's always easy to go back than to trailblaze ahead. And, and, and so I, I, we say, I, you know, it's what I used to know. It's, it's what I'm comfortable with. It's, it's, it's what I used to do. It's, it's the way I used to live. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with my old friends. You know, we get saved and Jesus wants to bring you out of that old life. But we say, well, it's so comfortable because they know me. And I just want to, I want to be part of that group, that circle. And Jesus is like, no, I'm pulling you out of that. You see, when Jesus finds Peter on a boat, he's fishing again. Do you remember the first time he found Peter? Peter was fishing. And this is twice now Jesus finds Peter on a boat fishing. And both times Peter has caught nothing. Either Peter's the worst fisherman of his day or the Bible's trying to teach us something. Because both times Peter has caught nothing. And I, I, I honestly think that the Bible's trying to teach us something. You see, the first time that Peter recognizes Jesus, he's sinful. Peter's sinful. And he recognizes because the backdrop was holiness and it was Jesus. And he, and he runs and he's like, depart from me because I'm wicked. He recognized that Jesus was holy. And Peter, Peter identifies himself as a sinful man. He took ownership. That was the first time you see Peter take ownership. He's like, I have sinned. I've done wrong. And Jesus tells him, he says, I'm going, to make you fisher, uh, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. At that moment, his life was forever changed. From that moment on, Peter left his occupation. He dropped the nets and he follows Jesus. Stay with me because we're going somewhere. But now, three years later, because that's at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his public ministry, when he's gathering his disciples, he finds Peter. Peter's fishing, no fish. He identifies. He takes ownership of his sinfulness. And then he changes his life, says, you're going to be a fisher of men. So for three years, Peter had hung out with Jesus, and he was catching men. Jesus sent out his disciples two by two, and they would go into different towns, and they would, they would, they would cast out demons, and they would, they would do these miracles, and they would teach the, 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 the words of Jesus that the kingdom of God is near. It, it, Jesus was prepping these guys for the future. So three years later, did God's plan for Peter's life change? Because Peter made a mistake? Because Peter failed, because Peter made some, some silly decisions, because Peter wasn't able to, to stay in the heat in the moment and, and, and stand up for his values and stand up for his, his Savior. Just because Peter fell, does that remove God's plan and his anointing over your life? I'm here to tell you absolutely not. The gifts of God are irrevocable. What God has ordained in your life, he still wants to complete in you. He says, listen, for those that love the Lord, they shall come to completion. 
God will finish the good work he started in you. You cannot return to old patterns. You can't return to the way things used to be. You can't return to what is comfortable. You can't return to that lifestyle. You have to press forward. But you're like, Pastor, you don't understand how many times I have failed. That's okay. Get back up. The Bible says that a righteous man will fall seven times, but he will rise again. You've got to trust the Lord. The anointing of God in your life. When God puts a plan in your life, he doesn't detour it just because you made a mistake. Oh, church, get a hold of that. Take hold of it and know that whatever God has planned for you, (laughs) he wants to see it fulfilled. You got to do your part. You got to take ownership and you can't return to old things. You see, Jesus is very clear. He makes this statement, and this statement is probably going to hurt a lot of us, but I need to say it because we can heal from it, okay? Tell your neighbor, it's going to be okay. Look him in the face, say it's going to be okay. Here's the statement. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's bold. It's crazy. It's, 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 it's scary. Is Jesus, is he saying that there's no hope if you look back? No, not at all. Not at all. What he is saying, though, is what I'm teaching you today is that if you accept the, the rebirth of the Holy Spirit in your life, you, you can't look back. You can't. You have to move forward. And moving forward is sometimes hard. Moving forward is sometimes unbearable. Moving forward is sometimes things we don't want to do. But if you trust the person pulling the plow, who is Jesus, listen, he will lead you to success. He will pull you into your destiny. He will pull you into what he has in store for you. He will pull you to where he wants you to be. But you cannot look back at your old life and go, I want that instead of this. You have to look forward, as Paul would say, and I forsake all those things that are behind me. There, I count them as rubbish. I count it lost because I want to see the glory of the Lord. Lord has to be your attitude because Jesus makes it very clear we can't look back we have to move forward so you, so you have to take ownership and 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 you and you can't return to old patterns whatever your old patterns are if it's if it's if it's returning to alcohol if it's returning to if if returning to food right because that that's you're you're unhealthy and you're eating right like whatever it is whatever it is You can't return to it. You have to trust the Lord to heal you through it. To heal you through it. Don't shift blame. It's you. It's you. I I, I love this this one counselor that um, Katie and I have gone to see. Her name's Dr. Irwin, and and she has this phrase. She, She has this phrase, and I love it because it's like, and this is what she says. She says, your heart your issue. Your heart, your issue. That does not allow you to shift blame. My heart, my issue. I deal with it. I confront it. I look at the reality of the truth of my heart. Where is it? What's going on with it? It's my heart. My issues are not because of another person or other circumstances. My issues are my issues because I made choices. Say, my heart, my issue. That's right. My heart, my issue. Here's, here's, here's the third thing. It's the difference between failure and success. You want to know the difference between failure and success in this story? When, 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 I, when I had this epiphany early in the week, I was, I was so excited about this one point because, because it's, it's amazing when you look at it. The difference between failure and success. The gang went fishing. Here's another lesson about our failures, right? They went fishing, and, and, and they caught nothing. But the difference between 
failure and success was the width of the boat. I want you to think about this. Jesus says, they, they, they're fishing, and he's like, cash your net on the other side of the boat. <laughs> like, come on, the, the width of the boat. Like, like, there's fish on both sides. But the difference of, uh, uh, between failure and success was the width of the boat. He says this in John 6, he says, throw your net on the, other, on the right side of the boat. It's always the right side, right? Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some, some what? Some fish. And they did and they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The width of the boat made a huge difference. How many times are we laboring? Listen to this. How many times are we, you, laboring in vain? How many times are we laboring in vain thinking we're doing this for the Lord, we're doing this for the kingdom of God, and, and, and you come short all the time and you fall flat on your face and you're like, I thought I was doing it for the kingdom of God. Maybe your motives were wrong. Maybe you had all the wrong ideas to why you were doing it, but you were convincing yourself. yourself. The proverb says this, there is a way that appears right to a man, but the, in the end it leads to death. Where the plow leads you is where you will find success. Is it, here's the question, is it the width of the boat or was it that they listened to Jesus? I, I think they listened to Jesus is why they had success. The blessing of God is poured out only when we listen. Listen, you can put in parentheses, obey. You want the blessings of God in your life? Obey. Obey. And they had, they had a full net. <laughs> it, it's amazing because when Jesus knows where Peter is and the plan for Peter's life never changed from the moment Peter met Jesus. It never changed. He was going to be fisher of men. Jesus had every right. That's what David said. He says, your, your, your verdict is just and your judgment is right. Right? Psalms 51. He said, you have every right. Jesus had every right to say, Peter, I'm going to choose someone else. Peter, I, 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 you know, you, you failed me three times. You, you failed me and, and I'm, I'm going to find someone else. Jesus had every right. But that wasn't Jesus' intention. Jesus' intention for Peter was for Peter to be a fisher of men. He told him, you're going to be a fisher of men. And Jesus leads him back to the beginning. Peter knew. His heart was pierced at that moment. Because he's like, there was a, there was a guy I met that told me to throw my net on the right side of the boat three years ago. And I had so much fish I could not contain. I had to bring other boats over to, to haul in the fish. Because they, they didn't recognize Jesus. And they dare not ask, is, is it you, Lord? But Peter knew because of the way Jesus was behaving that it was the Lord. There's, there's just something about the grace of God that when it hits a heart that is truly repentive, a heart that is truly <laughs> positioned towards God, like you break in his presence because you know you don't deserve it. You break. You weep. You're like, there's no way, Lord, that I deserve your grace. <laughs> no way. And that's why the Bible says it's his loving kindness that leads you to repentance. It's the Holy Spirit that woos you. When you have the revelation of how sinful you really are, the way Peter did, the way Isaiah did, the way every prophet has, when you have that revelation that you and I do not deserve the mercy or the forgiveness of God, but because of his love and his grace for us, 
It wrecks you. It crushes your heart. It's like, God, whatever you want, I'm going to do. You're going to tie your robe and you're going to jump in the water and you're going to swim 100 yards just to get to Jesus again. You're going to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus because your heart is so filled with love towards your Savior. My goodness, if you don't have that moment, my friend, you haven't had the revelation. You're you're still all head knowledge with God. But when you get 18 inches from your head to your heart, and it wrecks you. And when it wrecks you, you you don't want to return to old patterns. You want to take ownership because you want to be free from the guilt and the shame. You want to be free from all the stuff that, that failures bring to your life. You want to be free from it. So here, here's, here's the final thing is, do you love me? Right? So, so the first thing is, is we take responsibility with God. We take ownership of our failures. Second thing is we don't return to old patterns. And we recognize the difference between failure and success. The difference is that when you listen to God, blessings come in your life. It comes in your life. It was, it was the width of the boat. Here's, here's the final thing is, do you love me? Right? Jesus is now reinstating Peter. He's like, okay, Peter, you made a mistake, but, but I have a plan for you. And the question that Jesus confronts Peter with is, I think, is the same question he's asking you today. I think it could be applied in this moment. So whenever I'm talking about Peter, I want you to interject your name. I want you to interject your name. When, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, that's you, you put your name there. Jesus said to Oscar, he said, he said, do you love me more than these it's almost as Jesus is being harsh here. Because do you remember Peter's, Peter's moment when he, when he had that, that hubris moment with Jesus? He's like, he's like Peter, you, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, I will never do it. I love you more than these. John, John points Jesus back to reminding Peter. He's like, do you love me more than these? How many times have we told Jesus we love him more than others? How many times have we sat so hubris and so, so sanctimonious and we're like, oh, I would never do what brother so-and-so did. I would never do what sister so-and-so did. And we cast our stones, right? And we're ready to stone the woman who's, who's been caught in adultery. And, and, and Jesus is reminding Peter, because Peter used to be that way. Peter was that person. And he's like, do you remember when you failed me, Peter? You said you loved me more than these. He said, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time. You know what's happening here, right? Jesus is reenacting the whole moment that Peter denied him. Did you, did you catch it when I read it to you earlier? Jesus is sitting by a fire. Right? Where did Peter deny Jesus? By a fire. By a fire. <laughs> what, did, what did Peter say? I love you more than these. Jesus is bringing it back, and he's bringing it heavy. He's like, he's like if you love me, Peter, you're going to feed my sheep. If you love me, Peter... You're going to take care of my sheep. If you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. And, and it, seems, it seems like, like Jesus is, is, is presenting this harshness. But, but Jesus is, what he's doing, he's bringing healing to Peter's heart because he's reminding Peter, he's like, these are the things that I have against you. But my grace is so overwhelming that those things get wiped away. Huh. Listen. Listen, when the Lord comes to you, 
And he says, these are the things I have against you. It's not so that he can put his finger on you. It's so that you can be reminded of how much he loves you. So you can be reminded of his grace and his mercy in your life. And so, and so he, pretty much what Jesus is saying to him three times, he's like, listen, Peter, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. You say you love me, prove it. Prove it. Feed my sheep. I do love you. You say you love me, prove it. Take care of my sheep. You say you love me, prove it. I don't know where we went wrong and, and the Christian community, but we have taught a generation of young people that you don't have to prove yourself to God. We have taught them that it's grace alone, then that's all you need. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God. And God's grace is tremendous. And it is, it, it is for every person who would believe. And there's no way that you can earn your salvation. It comes by faith through grace that God has given us. It's a merit that he, he bestows upon us. But I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm not, because Peter's not getting saved again. Peter's being reminded of his call. He's being reminded of his duty. He's being reminded of the mantle that had been put on his head and put on his life. And so many times God's trying to remind you, maybe service after service, maybe preacher after preacher, maybe song after song, verse after verse. He's trying to remind you of the call that he's put on your life. He's trying to remind you of the mantle that he had given you maybe yesterday, two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. He's like, I'm not done with your life. If you're still breathing, then you have responsibility for the call that I put in your life. And he's reminding you of this. And so we have to prove ourselves. We have to prove that we love God. You're like, are you serious, pastor? Yes. Yes. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy, the young preacher. He says, listen, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Approved as a worker who does not need to be ashamed or and who correctly handles the word of God. Who are you proving yourself to? Not man, but God. It's, it's, it's Jesus asking you today, just like he asked Peter. He's saying, do you love me? I told you, insert your name when Jesus says, son of John, do you love me? Then show me you love me. Show me you love me. James says it this way, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But if someone says, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. If you love God, what James is saying is if you love God, you're going to do what God's called you to do. If you love God, your faith is going to move you into action. If you love God, your faith is going to engage you into kingdom things. No longer selfishness, no longer centered around your life. Listen, you're not going to orbit around your own life. You're not going to be self-centered, but now your faith is going to move you towards the things of God. He says, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? He said, good. Even the devils believe that and they shudder. You foolish person, do you not want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? What was, he says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. Listen to what he says. He says his faith was made complete by what he did. Not what he said, but what he did. And the scriptures was fulfilled to say Abraham believed God and it was credit to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. <laughs> Church, you need to hear this. He says in the same way, not even Rahab, the prostitute considered righteousness was for what she did, was considered righteousness for what she did. She gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So pretty much Jesus is saying, don't say you love me if you're not willing to prove it. 
Don't say you love me if you're not willing to forsake what's behind. Don't say you love me if you're not willing to to give everything. You see, how do we overcome our, our failures? prove it. Feed my sheep. Care for my sheep. Here, here, here's, here's the last statement I'm going to make to you, and then we're, we're going we're to pray. So stand your feet. Stand your feet with me. And we're, we'll be dismissed. Listen, this is it. Is there, there, is, there is, there's not a time in our relationship with Jesus in which stagnant faith is permitted. Hear what I'm saying to you. There is not a time in our relationship with Jesus when stagnant faith is permitted. It's not a time. Apathy is not allowed in the kingdom of God. Apathy is not allowed in the kingdom of God. Laziness is not accepted in the kingdom of God. Indifference is forbidden. Because if you love Jesus, then take care of his sheep. If you love Jesus, then feed his sheep. If you love Jesus, then obey his commands. some of us need to take responsibility and start with that and say, Lord, as David said, I have sinned against you. My transgressions are against you. You you want healing from our failures? It starts there starts there but then it progresses as you as you saw the sermon it, it just progresses and it gets to the point where Jesus makes you decide like yes I, I want healing from all my my hurt and my pain but it lead Jesus leads you somewhere and he says I'm gonna heal you <laughs> and I'm gonna wipe your transgressions away and I'm gonna cover you with my blood but it's gonna cost you something Consider the cost if you want to be my disciple. So, I, I, I want, I think it's appropriate. I really do. I think it's appropriate for anyone that just wants to say, you know what, I want to take ownership and I'm going to start there. I want you to come to the altar. I just want you to come. Just, just say, oh, you know what, I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to start right there. Just take ownership where I am with God. It's just me and God. Is me and God. That you know where you are with God. Maybe you haven't been feeding the sheep. You got to take ownership. Maybe you haven't been doing what God's called you to do. You got to take ownership. You got to move. You got you got you got to move to that point. And say, God, I'm going to take ownership. That's it. I'm going to take ownership. And 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 this is this is just a time with you and God. Just you and God. You, you, you got to be like David. You got to write your own love letter to God. You got to tell him why you're here. Why, why are you taking ownership today? There's more of you. 
Some of you have been, you've abandoned the call of God on your life and you've been in church and you've been thinking everything is fine. And here's the sermon where God exposes it. He, he pulls back the curtain of your heart and he says, listen, listen, years ago, I put this, this mandate on your life and you've been running from it. You've been avoiding it. You've been dodging it. But here's the time. This is your day. And God said, I'm, I'm speaking to you today. I'm, I'm coming to your heart today directly. But you got to take ownership. You got to move from where you are. <laughs> Church, we want a revival. It starts in the house of God. You, you want God to, to do incredible things? It starts here. It starts with us. It starts with everyone taking ownership and going, God, forgive me for not doing my part in your kingdom. Forgive me for not, for not doing what you've called me to do. Forgive me, God. I love you. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to feed your sheep. I'm going to do what you called me to do. I'm going to go after the loss. Anyone else? Anyone else? Because I, I, we want to move forward. Is there anyone else to say, I'm going to, I want to be part of this. I want to be part of what God's doing. You, you, you want an indicator? You want an indicator if you should be up here? Look at the fruit on your tree. Any, any disciples on it? Any disciples on your fruit? It's an indicator. God's calling us. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's like, this is it. All right. Those of you that are at this altar, I, I, just, I, just, I just want you to block out everyone in this room. Maybe you're responding and you're, on, you're, you're at home. Just, just block out what's going on at home. And I just want you to just talk to God. Just talk to God. Let, let his holiness be the backdrop of your life. Just, just begin to think about his goodness and his love for you. The Bible says if, if we confess our sin, as far as the east is from the west, he shall remember it no more. You could be free today. Today could be that day of freedom by confessing your sin, just saying, Jesus, I take ownership and I made some choices and I, 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 I've suffered the consequences, but I'm, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm asking you to restore unto me a pure heart. Oh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Restore, restore. Just ask him because he will. He will. Hello. Congregation, I just want I, I want you to sing over over your brother and sister. It's at the altar. This is a moment. This is a moment. You don't know what the Holy Spirit's doing in their life. It's incredible. Just just sing unto the Lord.